。立法會主席。The President。請各位繼續站立。Remembers, please remain standing. The Chief Executive will now enter the chamber. Stop shouting and go back to your seat. Members, please stop shouting at once and go back to your seat. Stop shouting. May I remind members again? When the chief executive is making his address and the members shout from your seat, disrupting the proceedings. I will have to ask members to leave the chamber. Sorry, speaker's not coming through. Members, please respect yourselves. Sorry, speaker's not coming through. Mr. Lang Kuo Hong. This is the Belt and Road uh, Shoe Shine Paint. There's no need to declare interest, Mr. Lang Guanghong. If you are going to dis if you continue to disrupt the proceedings, I was thinking that uh, you are be uh, behaving, um, you are not behaving properly. Please stop all that you're doing now. Hang Jing, you bring you, Mr. Yip Kok Him. I wonder if that pole there may pose any danger. Mr. Albert Chan has accepted the advice of staff. I will pay attention to that. Mr. Albert Chan, please take your seat. Members, members, members. The chief executive is already in the chamber for a few minutes now. I'm sure the public watching the TV broadcast are waiting for members to ask questions of the chief executive in relation to the policy address. The chief executive will first address the council. The chief executive, president, members, fellow citizens. I delivered a policy address yesterday. It's titled "Innovate for the Economy, Improve Livelihood, Foster Harmony, Share Prosperity." There must be fresh imp in impetus for Hong Kong to develop its economy. Externally, the um, most notable opportunities are presented by the National 13th Five-Year Plan and the Belt and Road Initiative. The Five-Year Plan proposes uh, to support Hong Kong in strengthening its position as a global hub for offshore renminbi business. And in promoting high-value added development of um, financing, trade and commerce, logistics and professional services, there is immense synergy potential uh, between Hong Kong and countries along the Belt and Road, and there's also strong complementarity. We have to seize upon the opportunities presented by the five-year plan and the Belt and Road Initiative. At the same time, we face uncertainties in the external environment and also keen competition from neighboring economies. So Hong Kong must um, consolidate and upgrade our in traditional industries, strengthen the emerging industries, and move towards high-value added development. 
and, and domestically, we must uh, fully support emerging industries and strengthen the competitiveness of traditional industries. Cultural and creative industries have immense potential. The government will inject an additional $400 million into the Create Smart initiative to support the development of these industries, in particular in nurturing startups and talent. Last year, the uh, Innovation and Technology Bureau was set up. It will also play an important role in Hong Kong's development towards high value addedness. Yesterday, I announced that the government will set aside $2 billion for the Bureau to invest in support to fund um, researchers of tertiary institutions. Another $2 billion will be uh, earmarked for the Innovation Technology uh, Venture Fund. So um, the for co-investing with fund uh, with private venture capital funds on a matching basis. On developing high and new technology and creative industries, this is the global trend. If we have to stand out from the many competitors, we have to be proactive. We must also not overlook uh, people's livelihood issue. In the policy address, uh, there are important measures announced on education and healthcare, such as the implementation of free quality kindergarten policy from 2017 to 18, and the spending of $200 million um, billion dollars in the next 10 years to increase another 5,000 public hospital beds and more than 90 operating theatres. On housing, this remains a priority task for this term of the government. This government has implemented demand side management measures such as increasing the special stamp duty, introducing the buyer's stamp duty and doubling the a Valorum stamp duty to stabilize the housing market and to give pri priority to the housing needs of permanent residents when supply is tight. Now, apart from the uh, demand side management measures, the government has uh, courage and determination to tackle the source problem of uh, imbalance in supply and demand. Uh, we have seen increase in housing supply recently, so property prices and rentals are beginning to come down. It shows that uh, the work of this government is beginning to yield results. We are going to keep up our effort. In the mid medium to uh, short term, the government will consider um, doing more land rezoning and increasing development density. We will also review comprehensively land use so that we can make the best use of our land resources. The government is actively de exploring with the MTRCL to develop the uh, uh, on the the development potential of uh, sites uh, on top of uh, current and ex uh, future stations and also railway-related sites. And uh, we expect that we could uh, provide another 12,000 units, including the site in Siuho Wan Thai uh, Land Tao. And also, there is a, we will continue to develop um, Kutong North, uh, Fanning North, and other new um, development areas. Uh, the Land Tao Development Advisory Committee will also um, consider uh, development in Lantau. Um, I have uh, implemented the measures since I took up office to support the disadvantage, like the old age living allowance, the Guangdong scheme, the $2 public fare uh, transport fare concession scheme, and the WIT work incentive transport subsidy scheme. And also, we started to take, we will be starting to take applications for the low uh, income. Um, Working family allowance from May this year. On environment, it is also an important area of our work. Uh, we can see that uh, air quality has substantially improved in Hong Kong. Uh, I understand many are concerned about water quality in the har what, uh, Victoria Harbour. The ha Air Harbour Area Treatment Scheme Stage 2 has been completed and water quality has been um, incre um, improved substantially. We are also considering further how we could um, improve the um, residual pollution and older problems. And uh, Retirement protection is an another important area of work of the government. We're not going to shy away from it. We will try our best to strive for consensus and while maintaining harmony. And I hope uh, members across, across the party in this council will um, cons work together for the long term and overall interest of Hong Kong. And we should be accommodating and, and understanding we should strive for consensus. And now I uh, welcome questions from members. The Chief Secretary will now take questions from members. Dr. An Chan. Thank you, President. In the policy address, in, um, you have a lot of visions on um, promoting the long-term development of our economy. And I believe that you're going to lay a solid foundation for our long-term economic development. But then visions cannot really address immediate concerns. The manufacturing industry and the trade sector have seen their business dropped. Retail and catering business are uh, also heading for um, cold winter. 
the uh, stock market has plummeted, renminbi has plummeted, uh, property prices have plummeted. Uh, everybody expects the economy to be poor the coming year. Now, many who work in restaurants and the catering business or in the retail business, uh, property services, um, renovation business, uh, a taxi business, um, minibus business, and so all the grassroots workers are worried that they're going to lose their jobs. So how are we going to salvage the uh, plummeting economy? How are you going to conserve jobs? C -C -E. Sorry. Mr. Leung Kwok Hong, if you disrupt the proceedings again, I will ask you to leave the chamber immediately. Chief Executive. President. Hong Kong is a um, small economy that is uh, highly open, so we are vulnerable to external factors. The government does take very seriously the possible problems to be faced by the various um, trades and industries in Hong Kong. In the policy address yesterday, I already mentioned the challenges that we might have to face. In terms of our immediate term work, or medium and long term work, we must uh, deal with all of them, all of the issues. For example, in the near term, uh, the tourism sector has been um, relying heavily on the mainland tourists. So we need to do more overseas promotion to bring uh, quality overseas visitors to Hong Kong. The sooner we do that, the sooner we see the results. Now, there are external factors affecting Hong Kong. We must take them seriously. But then we may not be able to control all such factors. What we can do is to enhance our competitiveness on all fronts uh, in terms of cost, in terms of effectiveness, and so on. I have m uh, said a lot about that in the policy address. You know, the financial services, logistics, shipping, uh, professional services, uh, intellectual property, uh, creative industries and so on, I mentioned about them. Now, some are traditional industries, some are emerging industries. We, so we have to take a multi-pronged approach to enhance the competitiveness of all these industries. Hong Kong also faces a lot of opportunities, although we face challenges as well. Well, we face challenges because uh, uh, the economy is slowing down in other places. But then uh, domestically, we also have uh, challenges uh, because uh, operating costs are high, because, uh, because of a shortage of land, of high rentals, and so on. Now, uh, we also need to bring in talents from overseas to uh, um, work together with Hong Kong to enhance our competitiveness. So there is not a straightforward answer for every problem. We need to have... Uh, a whole strategy, a comprehensive strategy to address all these issues. Dr. An Chan, uh, Mr. James Tan. Good morning, Chief Executive. In the policy address, you said a lot about certain issues, but you didn't mention some other issues. Last night on Facebook, I posted something similar. Uh, in the policy address, the Chief Executive uh, mentioned Belt and Road 42 times, but there was not a single mention of Li Bo. And then I said, well, when I have a chance, I'll ask the chief executive about it. Uh, but then uh, over a million people uh, reached it at over 2,700 likes and over 200 comments. And people said, if I don't ask this question today, you know, um, then I'm no man at all. So I have no choice but to ask the question. Well, the Lee Paul's incident may be an isolated incident, but it does lead to the question of whether mainland public security officers can enforce law in Hong Kong, and more importantly, at a high level. Now, we are talking about defending the one country, two systems, and high degree of autonomy. And the central authorities have been doing that actually over the years. Now, the, the American police could go to the Soviet Union to, arrest, uh, to, to Russia to arrest people, and other places go to other countries go to um, neighbors, the neighboring countries to uh, arrest people too. But it, it's never happened in Hong Kong. Now, uh, now many people, not just them, you know, the, the opposition camps always complaining anyway. But many are saying that if the public security officers could come and arrest people, does it mean that uh, this uh, philosophy of one country, two systems and uh, high degree of autonomy has been changed or has there been any change? The chief executive, you are the only person 
in Hong Kong in the sense that you're appointed by the central authorities, uh, you are elected by 1,200 people, and um, Chang Xiaoming said you have some superior status, so maybe you're the only person who could ask the central authorities about it. And if you ask questions, actually, it, it will do you a lot of good. Uh, Hong Kong people would appreciate you asking. Even if you're not going to get an answer, at least you must try to ask. Apart from Li Bo as an isolated incident, um, we are talking about the relations between the mainland and Hong Kong and one country, two systems. So are you going to fly to Beijing yourself? Are you going to make a call? Uh, say, uh, are you going to talk to the um, state leaders on the phone? So you could find out exactly what's happened with the labor case, and then you could give Hong Kong people an answers and address and allay our concerns. Chief Executive, on the Libor incident and, and the SARG attach a lot of importance to you, to it. Uh, together with uh, a number of government officials, including the uh, Chief Secretary for Justice and the Secretary for Security and Acting Secretary for Security, we've uh, said many times openly that the SAG, in relation to the one country, two systems, high degree of autonomy and uh, Hong Kong people administering Hong Kong, we've stated our stance clearly. Now, in the midnight, after the 31st of uh, December, I ended my leave and returned to Hong Kong. And on the 1st of January, Ms. Lee Bo's wife reported the case to the police and on the 2nd of January, I called um, the, Mr. John Lee, the Acting Secretary for Security, and I asked him to come over to the government house in the afternoon. And on the 4th of January, I held a press conference stating the stance I just mentioned. We attach a lot of importance to the incident because there are reports in the community that Mr. Lee Bo was taken away by public security <coughs> officers enforcing the law in Hong Kong. Now, we had to respond um, to this because we attached a lot of importance to that kind of reports. I said openly, and I restate here once again, that if there are mainland public public security officials, or as what Mr. James Ten said, um, security officials from other jurisdictions enforcing the law in Hong Kong, that's not acceptable under the basic law. I am very concerned about it, and the SARG is concerned about it, and the community is concerned about it. And I have reflected our concerns to the various levels and various uh, departments to express our concerns. Mr. James Tan, Chief Executive, I think Hong Kong people may not be aware of um, the process if you can actually go to Beijing yourself and ask for a meeting of the state leaders at the highest level, no matter what the outcome will be, I think you will get the support from the community. So please consider uh, don't do it through the Secretary for Security or making phone calls to deal with the matter. Chairman President, I attach a lot of importance to um, the matter. I would use every ways and means uh, feasible ways and means to resolve the matter. Let me supplement. Although Lee Bo's wife cancelled her report to the police, the police will go on investigating into the incident. And in the past few days, in fact, uh, you've seen reports of the uh, progress of the police. And a couple of days ago, the police have also set up a dedicated hotline asking the public to provide information to them. Mr. Albert Ho. President, on this very major issue, uh, Mr. James uh, Tien said that if he is not asking a question on that side, he would be considered a bad guy. So Hong Kong people are very concerned about this um, situation. We are anxious to see the outcome of the matter. Mr. Tian said this is an isolated incident. It's not the case. There was a report in 2013. There was a couple named, so named Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Poon when they were um, on their way to their homes in Hong Kong. They were suspected of uh, being taken away by powerful agents. And in Guangzhou, Mr. Poon, for 
conventional reasons. He was sentenced to jail for 17 years. He is still in prison. So this is a very serious incident. This is not just an isolated incident. Mr. James Tian put it in a very nice way. He made that request to you, and you are just sticking、uh, to your old line, rehashing the old answer. And you said that you were talking and discussing repeatedly with your subordinates,、um, and then you held a press conference. What, what good does it do? And you said that you were trying to understand the situation from, from various government departments. We don't know what you were up to. So, put simply, Hong Kong people are, are, are waiting for you to give us a, a simple answer. I have three questions for you. First, what kind of government departments have you got in touch with?、Uh, how many times have you done that? That's a simple question. Second, up to today, do you have any、uh, preliminary or simple response? And that is, apart from Li Po and Um, other four other Hong Kong people involved in the Causeway Bay、um, bookstores, a total of、uh, five people. As of now, are they on the mainland? If they are, are they being detained by government departments? That's the second point. And if not, then what government、uh, departments in China on the mainland will be doing to protect their personal safety? Third, if they are detained by government departments on the mainland,、uh, have you asked、um, SAOG representatives to visit them and follow up on their situation? Please be specific in your answer. Don't try to gloss over the matter in your answers. CE, the SAOG doesn't know the ins and outs of this Li Bo incident.、Uh, Li Bo's wife reported the case to the police, and she provided some facts. And in media reports,、uh, we saw some、um, information as well. So the first task for us is to we try to understand the facts before we can try to、um, go ahead with what needs to be done.、Uh, not just myself, but the security bureau and the police are on various levels. For example, on the operational level and so on, we're trying to do. Um, a lot in the past ten、uh, days or so, I said on the second of January, I、uh, talked to the phone and met the acting security f-、uh, secretary for security. So it shows my concern towards the met- matter. I think we are con- get、um, concerned and involved earlier than the community as a whole, and there. There's no reason why the SAOG would not express our concerns to the central authorities. We will go on with our investigation work, Mr. Albert Ho. Well, he's not answering my question. You said that you are asking questions, posing questions to your subordinates, sir.、Uh, this、uh, the security bureau. Are you telling me that the security bureau has liaised with the public security authorities on the mainland, and did they get any answer? We're not interested. In how many meetings you held with your subordinates? What we are interested is whether you have liaison with the cent-、uh, with the mainland authorities. Whether you get an, any answer? It's now been ten days. Now,、um, together with three other people, they have gone missing for nearly two months. Well, it seems that there isn't a preliminary answer yet. And、uh, Mr. James Tan's、um, demand is very reasonable. On the Manila hostage incident, we sent officials actually down to Manila. So I have a, a very specific follow-up question, which represents the views of many Hong Kong people. At least the security,、uh, the secretary should go to Beijing and try to get an answer. If, if you can't even do that, you and the secretary for security should not be in a position. You should resign immediately. Members, silence, please. President, we are still investigating the case. Therefore, we are not at liberty. To disclose all the information that's become known to the police at this stage, as I said, over the past、um, ten days or so, the work of the the effort we've made by you know by myself, by the secretary for security and so on,、um, uh, is evident to all. Mr. Lam Guo Hong, what is your question? Well, I heard just now the C said he was、uh, going to the airport to receive someone. It's not your turn to speak. I warn you again: if you disrupt our proceedings again, I cannot let you stay in this chamber, Mr. Lam Kuo Hong. Mr. Vincent Fang, please ask your question. 
Good morning, Chief Executive. Yesterday, in your policy address, there's、uh, much coverage on the Belt and Road Initiative. As a、um, SAL government, I think it's right for us to support the central authorities. Now, you're devoting a lot of resources to innovation and technology. It's true, Hong Kong lags far behind in this area, and I think it's right too that you put in so much money so we could try to catch up. On housing, you've done a lot too. Now, I'd like to follow up on what、uh, Dr. En Chan just mentioned: the retail business, the catering, hotel, and hotel. Uh, and uh, wholesale business are, are all suffering now. Now you want to encourage students from Belt and Road countries to come and study in Hong Kong. So you have injected one billion dollars to the tar-、uh, targeted scholarship fund. But then for the industries I just mentioned, you never mentioned them in the policy address. There are no measures at all to help them tide over the difficult times. You know our competitiveness is declining day by day. Wages keep going up. You say there's moderate growth in the economy, and the unemployment rate is on the low side. You think it seems that you think that's good. Now, from the point of economics, if the、um, unemployment rate reaches three percent, is not a good sign. That means our competitiveness is sliding. So, what are you going to do about manpower in Hong Kong? In Hong Kong, we face、um, challenges both、uh, domestically and from outside, and our economy is not doing well. But then there is so much filibustering and confrontation in this chamber. There is so much bickering. So, what can you do to help Hong Kong address all these challenges domestically and coming from outside? Chief Executive, in our overall GDP, trade and logistics. Are the biggest contributors. Logistics is very much um, um, led by trade usually, and、uh, our largest commodities、uh, trading combat- partner is no longer the U.S. and the European Union as in the past, but rather the Asian countries, the ten Asian countries. The ten Asian countries are now our second largest trading partner. After the mainland, in the past few years, we've done a lot of work. We had、uh, individual negotiations with the ten Asian countries on free trade agreements, and there's hope that、uh, in this year we're able to sign the FTAs with the ten countries. Now, these countries, of course, will、uh, refer to each other's position. During the negotiations, when I first took up office, some countries opposed、uh, signing FTAs with Hong Kong. That's why the Asian countries didn't sign these FTAs with us. But then、um, the Asian is our second largest、uh, trading partner, so we realized the importance of trade to Hong Kong.、Uh, we hope that this year we're able to sign the FTAs, and、uh, after we sign the FTAs, that would help to promote the trade relations between Hong Kong and the Asian countries. And for the Asian countries, they are still enjoying rather rapid economic growth. Indonesia is the largest country of the ten Asian Asian countries in terms of GDP and the population size. So that's why,、um, well, we've actually、um, been discuss negotiating with the Indonesia in the past、uh, year or two. We're going to set up an、um, economic and trade office in Indonesia this year. That shows that、uh, we are not sparing any effort in promoting economic development in Hong Kong. Now, Mr. Fang refers to money for the tourism industry. In the policy address report,、uh, I've proposed th-、uh, to give funding to the tourism board, and it's not a fund. It's not uh, funds uh, set up、uh, as such, but、um, because you don't spend up all the funds、uh, immediately. Rather,、uh, we ha- have funding to support、uh, long-term projects. Now we're going to promote、um, tourist attractions in Hong Kong overseas. So we're giving money to the tourism board to do that. So we do re- know the needs of different industries. 
on innovation and technology, as you pointed out, Mr. Fang, we are um, devoting more paragraphs to that this year. The innovation and technology actually could support other industries like the financial services industries. We're talking about fintech these days, finance, uh, financial technology. So innovation and technology could support the development of different industries as well. So that's why we must uh, press ahead with these tasks. Now, in Hong Kong, we face a, a lot of opportunities as well. Mr. Fang mentioned the challenges. We must overcome the challenges, but at the same time, we must seize upon the opportunities presented. Mr. Fang, Chief Executive, you have one and a half years left in your term. What we're most concerned about is the next one and a half years. The industries have to face a lot of difficulties. So how can you help us? How can you help us to get out of this um, difficult position? And what must the industry do so we could uh, tide over this? Well, you tell them to um, to just um, um, bite the tea, um, just to, to, you just tell them to, to suffer this. But for how long? I'm not talking about longer term, I'm talking about the next one and a half years. Chief Executive. Now, in the policy address, I mentioned, say, for tourism, uh, industry. There are fewer mainland visitors, so we try to bring more overseas visitors to Hong Kong. Uh, we're making various efforts, and we have seen there are more overseas visitors coming to Hong Kong. We want the industry to support our effort. Um, now, for example, there's more discuss uh, rather uh, much discussion these days about the work of the Travel Industry Council, so the industry must uh, work together with the council. Now, the industry and the government uh, all have to do their work, and uh, such work is intertwined, and we are always happy to listen to the views of the industry. Mr. Tan Kapu, in the middle of last year, after the constitutional reform exercise, you stressed that we should focus on the economy and people's livelihood. Now, this uh, policy address covers uh, a lot. You spent a lot of time on uh, economy and people's livelihood. Even the, some district councillors um, admired you for the details you mentioned in relation to people's livelihood. But uh, somehow, but labour issue is related to people's livelihood, but uh, for the FTU, we are very disappointed. In the past few years, we've been accommodating, we've been understanding, and now we've been let down. On the uh, offsetting of MPF, there's no mention at all. Standard working hours, just a brief mention, and the two statutory holidays, there's no mention at all because it's not in your election manifesto. So, Chief Executive, are you confident that you would uh, could deliver on the pledges you made in relation to labour rights and so you could uh, be accountable to the working population? Within my term, I will strive to deliver the pledges I made in my election manifesto, including the two difficult issues uh, just mentioned by you. As you know, in a community, there are divergent views on the two issues, the labor sector, grasswood uh, sector, and um, the uh, business sector. They have different views in terms of philosophy, in terms of source of uh, funding, and um, the um, sharing ratio of the responsibilities and so on. But uh, but uh, we are confident we can do something. The uh, relevant policy bureau and bureau directors have been working hard on this. Now, in the policy address, uh, we have not mentioned much about uh, standard uh, uh, about these issues because we're still trying to listen to views uh, that includes the issue of retirement protection. The chief secretary and um, the uh, policy directors uh, have been actively seeking views so that we could narrow the differences. So we continue to do that. And then in my election manifesto on my pledges about labor issues, I will strive to deliver these pledges in within my term. Mr. Tang, well, the uh, pledges of this government should be completed by this government. But there's just one and a half years left. And I must uh, also admit that uh, the economy is going to be poorer in a coming period. And employees will say that they're just adding to their burden. So how is it possible for you to deliver your pledges? Uh, last time at the uh, C's question and answer session, Mr. Wong Kohing already made a suggestion that it's uh, for 
government funded organizations, you must take the lead in offsetting NPF. You don't have to wait for the bosses to give their nod. But uh, you won't even do that, so that's why we're not confident. We would like to have a comprehensive approach in addressing the offsetting and other issues. Now, Mr. Tang uh, is very much concerned whether we are able to uh, complete the task within this term of the government. But whether we can do it or not, it really depends on those with divergent views in the community. It depends on whether they're willing to sit down and talk to each other and try to understand each other's position better and see whether there's any room for narrowing down the differences. But if we, uh, everyone just sits down and say, this is my position, otherwise I won't uh, call any, uh, attend any meetings, I won't uh, discuss anything. If that's the position, it's very difficult for the government to come to a new arrangement that's acceptable to all in the community. Now, these issues have been in the community for a long time. It means that they are complex and uh, tough issues to tackle. And we cannot have just one side winning. Maybe we're talking about win-win or even multiple win situation. At the end, we're talking about the overall and long-term interests of the community. That's why towards the end of my policy address speech, I hope said that I hope everyone would be understanding and accommodating so we could all benefit from the fruits of prosperity. If everyone st stands firm on his or her own position, there's no way we can move forward. We'll stand still. Because if we're not able to narrow down differences, how are we going to make progress? I don't see how. Dr. Kwok Kaki. Thank you, President. If you talk about thick skin, if you talk about someone being a liar, see why you have to be the first. You're unprecedented on that front. Young uh, old people have been waiting for a long time for long-term retirement protection. And you're telling them, I'll give you an extra toilet in the playground. Old people are waiting to go into homes. 5,000 people die every year. And over three years, just giving them um, 240 places. Students um, are debt ridden uh, doing the associate degree programs. So you're spending ten, uh, $1 billion to bring in students from the Belt and Road countries. And then people are paying high rents, and you just draw them a picture and ask them to look at it and uh, hope. President Xi Jinping asked you to promote harmony, but you continue to pitch yourself against the uh, public. If you have um, any uh, uh, general comments on the policy address, you can wait till the debate. Uh, to please come to your question. Chief Executive, it doesn't matter. Uh, how many times you receive gas at the airport? Uh, the um, central authorities have now downgraded your status. You were just sitting on one side of the table. Now you want to keep Hong Kong a safe city. But Hong Kong people feel that we are very unsafe. The Global Times has already stated there is a powerful agency that um, evades the, the law and um, Libor was made to vanish. At least, can you tell us where Libor is? You are the super connector. And then this morning, I um, came across a um, resident. He asked me to say this to you. Uh, he said, there's no point to ask you to step down because you're so thick-skinned. But at least um, uh, you, the only wish you could grant the people of Hong Kong is to say that you're not going to seek re-election. Well, um, Dr. Kokaki was quoting out of context of my policy address. We attach great importance to the education of our young people in Hong Kong. This year, we have um, a large amount of recurrent spending. It's not a one-off fund um, injection. That is implementation of free quality kindergarten education. Each year, we have to spend $6.7 billion dollars Compared to the current voucher scheme, we're talking about an extra $3 billion a year in spending. Now, Dr. Kwokaki mentioned scholarships. We also want young people to have the opportunities to study abroad. We have an, a scholarship sch scheme for excellence, scholarship for excellence scheme. You know, I launched it last year in the policy address. And uh, there were students attending 
in tertiary institutions overseas, overseas. Um, last time when I asked, there were about 80 people in October last year when I visited the UK. I visited about a dozen of students who were studying in the UK. And then in paragraph 193 of the policy address, I said that we want to nurture more talent, so we propose to set up a um, quality education fund. Uh, there is a gifted education fund, rather, um, with $800 million. So we do have uh, various new initiatives proposed in the policy address. Dr. Kwakaki was quoting out of context. He said, uh, because of these measures uh, I've announced in the policy address, it, that goes to show that we don't care about the educated young people in Hong Kong. That is not true. So in, I hope the public uh, will try to get a comprehensive understanding of the policy address so you know what we're going to do in the coming year. And in the past 24 hours, we've come across some comments. Obviously, some thought that the Belt and Road is related to the mainland. It's about investing in the mainland, doing something on the mainland, and so on. So on. Or some say that for this uh, scholarship scheme, the 100 places are for mainland students. But that is completely wrong. Some members asked uh, whether we support the Belt and Road Initiative of the country. The Belt and Road Initiative presents many opportunities to Hong Kong for the financial services and the business sectors. They all understand it. That's why in the past year, uh, I, uh, when I attended many seminars on Belt and Road Initiative, I saw uh, many business uh, from the business sector and so on. They've done their own studies. And, consul, uh, and the consulates general also attended uh, these seminars because it will also... Uh, they're very much concerned about the development of their own economy and so on as a result of Belt and Road Initiative. Hong Kong is a highly open economy. We are talking about over 60 other overseas countries under the Belt and Road region. We must not um, forsake the opportunity to develop ties with them. CY Leung is just uh, reading, reciting from a script. I, I'm not interested in discussing Belt and Road Initiative with you. Global Times stated um, clearly that the people missing were taken away by powerful agents, and people speculate that they're on the mainland. So at the very least, can you tell us where Le Libo is? Is he on the mainland? Chief Executive, we don't have any information to share with you. We're now trying to understand the situation from various sides. Let me repeat the question. Is he on the mainland? Do you know or not know? Dr. Kwok, you have already asked your question. Mr. Christopher Zhang. Thank you, President. Chief Executive, in your policy address, you mentioned that the steering committee for the Belt and Road will be set up and a Belt and Road office comprising various government departments will be set up and it will strengthen Hong Kong's role in this uh, nation's initiative. And then $100 million will be um, used uh, to groom talent. I think these uh, can help um, arts um, initiate uh, new measures on that. Well, but in we 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 uh, don't see a gloomy uh, we don't see a prosperous uh, economic future for Hong Kong, and there is a circuit-breaking uh, circuit breaking mechanism on the mainland, and the um, stock stock index has uh, plummeted to a record low in the uh, past two years, and there are speculators, and the stock market and the foreign exchange market have been volatile and the prospects for the tourism industry are very bleak. Uh, Chief Executive, uh, people said that they are worried that the volatility in the stock market and the foreign exchange market will deal a blow to Hong Kong's economy. And the exchange um, Head, the chairman said that uh, we should uh, be staying vigilant on this situation. How should we um, face that kind of challenges and deal with them? Chief Executive, Mr. Christopher Zhang's um, question is related to two fronts. First is about the volatility in the financial market on the mainland and also the slowing down of the economy on the mainland. 
well, even if this is the case, um, the, the mainland's economic growth is, is still higher than Hong Kong's. Um, there are, is volatility in the financial market, the slowing down of the mainland economy. That will be that will pose an indirect impact on Hong Kong's economy. For example, trade between Hong Kong and the mainland. Um, mainland uh, tourists coming to Hong Kong. Well, impact will be created on those fronts. And also the volatility in the financial market on the mainland. Will it create um, um, vol volatility in the Hong Kong market as well? So this is something that we are paying attention to. The FST, uh, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the uh, FSTB are adopting different measures to deal with this situation. When there is volatility in the mainland market, our stock prices may be affected, but then um, the fundamentals of the Hong Kong stock market are not affected. So we ha we should have confidence in that. Of course, we should not um, take the matter lightly. We would uh, closely monitor the situation as to the impact on our physical economy. Um, in terms of uh, tourism and trade, we will be subject to influences. Hong Kong is an international city. We have an open economy, and there is a need for us to um, actually broaden our trade networks so that we are not putting all the eggs into one basket, um, into a one single market. So that's why even uh, when we are implementing short-term measures, we should also have uh, some long-term initiatives um, in the past couple of years, the SARG has been putting a lot of effort in fostering closer trade relationships with ASEAN countries. If we are do a good job on that front in terms of trade, tourism, logistics, um, the our main targets, uh, our, our trade partners will be um, diversified. Mr. Cheng, this, on the steering committee for the Belt and Road, Chief Executive would you be formulating specific policies and measures, for example, streamlining the application procedures for the financial sector so that the securities, more securities companies can participate in asset management and financing business that will help um, further development of the financial sector and also for the AIIB. Um, well, with that, is there any progress of um, setting an, a an business center under the AIIB in Hong Kong? We are working very hard to take part in the AIIB. Hong Kong is an international uh, business center um, and also an international business center for the mainland as well. So we want to take part in the AIIB business and get some of these business in Hong Kong. Can there be further room for streamlining procedures and so on? The HKMA has made some proposals, and our financial uh, bureaus are attaching importance to it as well. If uh, friends from the finance sector have uh, recommendations on um, improvement measures for financial sectors, which can help promote about role initiative, um, uh, or ears to such uh, comments. Now, as to the relationship between financial sector and Bell Road Initiative, one of the focuses, um, as stated in my policy address, is that we um, engage in renminbi business, a renminbi offshore center, um, and we would be um, working on renminbi financial products. These are businesses that can be further developed in Hong Kong. If we are interested in um, going global, then this is something that we can further study. Mr. Sitho. Thank you, President. I heard the um, CY, uh, Mr. Chief Executive's remarks on um, uh, radio programs, and he talked about harmony, um, universal retirement protection, uh, standard working hours, and offsetting mechanism. And he said that these three issues have um, caused a lot of uh, conflicts in the society. Well, actually, these are related to your pledges in your election manifesto. And if you knew that if these three issues could not be resolved and your pledges could not be um, 
realized and that would create conflicts, why don't you resolve these issues? But then um, there is little mentioned on these three issues. There are only 54 words in related to universal retirement protection. But this is one of your pledges in your election manifesto. The policy address. Well, seems not to um, a document trying to uh, get support from the community to seek career re-election. If you think that Hong Kong support is not important for your seeking a re-election, say so. And then um, if you think you're not getting re-elected, tell us. Then all our grievances will be cleared. And then, or is it your strategy that you are just trying to please the central authorities and you are disregarding Hong Kong people to the extent that you are not even willing to realize your pledges in your election manifesto? Ms. Sitho, every time uh, when I um, attend to CNE's uh, Q&A session, I will bring along with my with me my election manifesto and um, on the 1st of July I would update you on the progress of the implementation of the pledges in my election manifesto. Ms. So you can actually um, take a look again at how I wrote these um, e three issues in my election manifesto. Now the policy address was drawn up based on the needs of Hong Kong, uh, medium t uh, term needs and long term needs and I, I I'm trying to implement the issues one by one. Now, three years ago, we thought the housing issue was a, a difficult one. Uh, poverty um, was another difficult issue. Environmental protection, again. And then in the three years, we're delivering results on these three issues. And we've got statistics to show that the rental prices and property prices are declining. Uh, the number of poor population has declined. And there has been an improvement in our air quality, water quality. Why? Because we've been uh, delivering the results and implementing the pledges in my election manifesto. There are these three remaining long-standing problems and issues, and I think we must uh, have mutual understanding on all sides to resolve these issues. Well, one side doesn't want to uh, give too much money out, and the other side wants more money. That's it. And in the policy address on retirement protection, uh, I didn't um, spend a lot um, uh, of paragraphs on that because we right now we are doing consultation. We listed all the facts, um, the constraints we face. We listed the financial statistics. We list the options, and so on. These are being discussed by the community, and I hope in the future. Um, the community can proactively discuss the issues. And it should not be the case that if you don't accept my stand, then I will boycott you. I will not discuss with you. You can imagine um, how we'll, what will come out of it if we adopt that kind of stance. So this is uh, these are works that have to be uh, done. And, and actually, you can compare what I've written in the policy address and what's written in the election manifesto. Ms. Ho. President, election pledges are solemn pledges. Um, years, four years ago, the chief executive went to listen to the views of the public. He tried to l lobby support from the uh, people. He w said he went with um, stool, um, notebook, and a pen. But uh, these things have vanished altogether. Now, retirement protection, standard working hours, and uh, MPF offsetting, they are nowhere to be seen. And then you're even talking about importing labor. So. Where is your current concern about the uh, grassrooters? Now, some people may have believed in you when you made the pledges, but are you going back on your words now? The uh, Chief Secretary and uh, the Policy Bureau directors have done so much in doing consultation and so on, and they've done so much in uh, supporting the poor. And I'm just spelling out my, if I have to spell out all my views, and positions again in the policy address, and some uh, members or some in the public may say that we are doing fake consultation. But actually, in the, my election manifesto, I mentioned retirement protection. At that time, um, during the election, there were people who expressed various views, and I listened to the, all the views. And uh, uh, I knew that if we ha had to uh, proceed with universal retirement protection. We're talking about huge public spending. And then there are people with other needs. They may still be um, given universal retirement protection. Do we really need it? So 
Miss Ho, in my election manifesto, I never mentioned universal retirement protection. I mentioned retirement protection, but I must reiterate, I must reiterate, we are now consulting the views of the public on this issue. We are ready to listen, uh, willing to listen to the views of the public. If um, the public believe that we don't have to have regard to the financial position of a person, whether uh, if we're regardless of rich uh, or poor, we are going to give them uh, we should give them retirement protection. We're willing to listen to the views. Mr. Michael Ten. Well, in the past few years, in the past address, when you talk about um, the education issue, uh, there's no philosophy uh, that you spoke of. Maybe people say that uh, of the three CEs, uh, you are the least concerned with the education, like um, English language teaching and so on. Now, in Germany, um, there's now a ban on the over-developing children uh, pre-education, or in Taipei. And you know, um, parents, um, uh, tens of thousands of parents have set up um, um, chat groups. They don't want the children to become slaves of homework. They are, f are striving for the abolition of uh, P3 TSA. They've actually targeted um, Eddie Ng, mm, the Secretary for Education, they've got protested to him. TSA uh, has uh, resulted in excessive drilling. You know, a six, seven-year-old has to have to do homework till 11 p.m. at night. So many have uh, told you about that. I'm sure through you, um, through Mr. Eddie, mm, which see you have learned how beautiful the autumn foliage was in Japan. But do you know about the suffering of parents and these young children? If you know about that, how come you don't mention it at all in the policy address? That's my first question. My second question. Now, you have delivered four policy addresses so far. What about improving the uh, English standards of our next generation? There's no mention at all. But then four years ago, in your election manifesto, uh, the fifth point under education, you said uh, Hong Kong is an international city, so we must um, take seriously the uh, standard of English here. So how come in your four policy addresses, never once did you mention this at all? And also, uh, uh, Belt and Road, you mentioned it 40 times in your policy address. The Belt and Road Initiative covers 65 countries. What is the common language of the 65 countries? I'm sure you know. So on this issue, I hope you would uh, respond to it. Please, for our next generation, help them to enhance their competitiveness. Chief Executive, English is the lingua franca in the world, so we attach great importance to it. It's not that uh, because in the one or two hour speech on the policy address, we don't mention it, so the SAR government is not doing anything about it. In the policy address, we can only focus on key issues, so we can tell the public what we're going to do in the coming year or even in the longer time frame. English has always been an issue of concern in Hong Kong. You know, group sponsoring bodies, parents all take English very seriously. I'm sure you know about that. Mr. Michael Ten mentioned that our students uh, are presented with opportunities under the Belt and Road Initiative. It's true. But then there are also other students coming from other places. And these are not students from Hong Kong. And we don't have just teachers from Hong Kong. We have overseas students, not many, maybe one or two such students in a class, there, what is the common language? English. So that would help the English standards of local students. We're not just talking about textbook English. So that's something we may consider if we could bring in these students. And then Mr. Michael Tan, you mentioned TSA. Yes, I attach great importance to the issue as well. It's not mentioned in the policy address. It doesn't mean that the Chief Executive or the Education Bureau do not take this seriously. It's rather because we have a committee now reviewing TSA. I've uh, personally asked for the test paper of the Education Bureau on P3 TSA. It's from the Education Bureau, not from the um, community and not from the market. Again, I've asked uh, people to buy um, the simulated test papers uh, in the market. I spent about $600, 
and it was just an arbitrary selection. I can tell you for the test paper you get in the market and from the test paper published by the Education Bureau, there's a difference of one or two levels in terms of difficulty. So what's the purpose of this um, um, simulated test paper? Is it necessary to ask P3 students to um, practice such papers which goes beyond the standards of a P3 student? Those are the questions some have asked. Mr. Michael Tan, Chief Executive, if you want um, to convince people as a leader uh, on something, but then you don't mention it at all in your four policy addresses, really you have to think about that carefully. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to draw on that. I ask whether there is any policy to respond to uh, pressure coming from homework. In Germany, in Taiwan, they have a policy, so making an appeal is not good enough. For education before the age of 12, what is your philosophy? Do you think it's uh, about um, instilling interest, um, promoting interest in learning, or what? I think you are asking a lengthy follow-up, Chief Executive, please. Well, taking TSA as an example, the Education Bureau has said that we don't want schools to drill students excessively. That's about pressure coming from homework. But I'm sure Mr. Michael Tan knows the response of schools. Mr. Tan, you've asked your question. Mr. Albert Chen, 689 just now did not answer the question on Lee Bo because he's a learning, uh, um, learning from the uh, um, fine tradition of uh, Lam, Lam, Mr. Lam. 689 is his name. Well, Mr. Albert Chen, I've reminded members in the past that um, during the question and answer session, you must refrain from making speech that offends the, the chief executive. 689 is nothing offensive. It's the, about the number of votes he got. Unless he denied he got 689 votes, it's not even vulgar language. Now, um, he did not answer the question on Lee Bo because uh, he's learned from Mr. Stephen Lam. Now, and uh, it, uh, he said in the past that uh, even if we make an inquiry is offensive, uh, he would rather visit um, the pa a panda than a uh, missing Hong Kong person. And we don't know if he's safe or not. And that's the tradition of uh, Hong Kong Communist Party members. And I'm explaining why he didn't answer the question. In June this year, at the uh, People's Great Hall, Xi Jinping was meeting with uh, representatives of the AIB country members, and he shook hands um, most in a most friendly manner with um, John Zhang, the financial secretary. Afterwards, there was a 2,000-word interview report published in the uh, Xinhua Agency. Uh, it, he was praised for his com competence and so on. Please come to your question, Mr. Chen. So that's why in a policy address, um, the chief executive wouldn't be left behind. He spent, he used uh, some 3,500 words to talk about the Belt Road Initiative. He wants to um, do better than the Xinhua agency. Uh, obviously, he's trying to get the attention of uh, Xi Jinping and to get his support as well. Now, his uh, policy address is not about benefiting Hong Kong, it's about making Hong Kong suffer. He, didn't mention many of the issues. In the past three policy addresses, at least, uh, there's a paragraph on core values. This time round, there's not even this paragraph. You just make brief mention in some cases. And on uh, a clean government, again, uh, you're saying less and less on it. You spend more than two minutes um, making a speech, Mr. Chen. I'm talking about him um, making Hong Kong suffer. He's um, eradicating core values, he's uh, eradicating clean government, he's trying to destroy the natural beauty in Lantau Island. So how much longer is he going to make Hong Kong suffer? Now he hasn't answered the questions about the $50 million he pocketed. So the, his policy measures are uh, making Hong Kong people suffer. Our core values are l disappearing, uh, natural beauty, is um, being destroyed completely. Mr. Albert Chen, you're making a statement, rather. So how long is he going to make us suffer? Chief Executive, President, 
on one country to systems, high degree of autonomy, Hong Kong people administering Hong Kong towards um, the implementation of these three principles that actually comes into our everyday governance. How should we make the best use of the National 13th and Five Year Plan, SEPA, Belt Road Initiative? Please, quiet, please. Uh, we would should take advantages of um, one country, two systems, and and um, taking part in these plans. So, if Mr. Albert Chan wants to associate one country, two systems with the Libor incident on the fourth of January, this is Monday, and I haven't waited for the regular exco meeting before I met with the press. I especially did that one day in advance on a Monday, and I invited the members of the press to come over to express my um, concern. And I told the community that we would continue to pay concern to it. And that shows that I am steadfast to implementing one country to system principles. He hasn't answered my question. President, the chief executive doesn't know what uh, is really um, a post getting very popular on social media. This is a spear. Well, even if you use 3,500 words on the initiative, that's no use. Um, Premier Lee shook hands with uh, John Zhang. Even if you used 3,500 words, it's no use. It's just a, that's a, it's like just a spear that you're using. Well, how long are you going to make Hong Kong suffer? You've not been able to achieve anything. You're just making life difficult for us. You are destroying the beauty in Atlantau Island. When will you stop? Making Hong Kong suffer. Six, eight, nine. Mr. Albert Chan, please uh, sit down. Sorry, the speaker is not coming through. It's not your turn to speak, Mr. Leung Kwok Hong. Please sit down, Mr. Leung Kwok Hong. Does he know what is this um, spear? Members should not use this question time to make statements on things which are not related to the policy address. Any response, um, Chief Executive? In the past several years, Mr. Albert Chen just now mentioned some livelihood issues. Housing, land are um, long-standing and difficult issues. Well, in the market, actually, we we see what's happening. Then there are statistics coming out, and many organisations in the market are providing the updated statistics. There have been a decline in property and rental prices. We are seeing a glimmer of of hope in the issue, and in the past, uh, in the next two to three years, there will be a record high production of uh, private properties. And we've got the 10-year long-term steering uh, committee on housing. The poverty ratio has dropped to a record low. And the um, environment has improved in terms of um, the environmental protection aspect. So we've done a lot in um, poverty alleviation work. So Mr. Albert Chen should take note of these achievements. Mr. Chen, um, your question time ha has passed. Mr. Albert Chan, please leave the chamber immediately. Mr. Albert, uh, Mr. Raymond Chan, Mr. Albert Chan, leave the chamber immediately. Leave the chamber immediately. Members, please uh, ask questions. Mr. Leung Chi Chang, thank you, President, Chief Executive. Recently, and actually uh, yesterday, you delivered the policy address. Well, you set a precedent here, and you spent close to two hours in delivering it. 
But then on the housing issues, little has been mentioned. So I would like to pose a question to you on this. Recently, the, the transaction numbers and the property prices in the private property market, well, the statistics show that there is a downward trend of the property market. Well, though it's property prices are dropping, it's, they are uh, still far beyond the affordability of the public. Well, it's too early to withdraw the cooling measures, of course, and not long ago, the um, THB has released a, an annual report on the long-term housing strategy, and in the next 10 years, the production heart target will be um, decreased by 10,000 units. So this gives us the impression is that the government wants to um, support the market, and that's why you are making this downward adjustment. Well, we don't think that is a problem with the private property market. Well, I think it's, it's all natural to have certain adjustments in the private property market. But why are you adjusting downwards the number of HOS as well? You give people the impression that you're trying to support the market by doing so. Now, if there is an adjustment, land will be vacated. Will you be building PRH uh, units on those uh, vacated sites so that more people can get a PRH unit. Can you explain the adjustment in the production of housing? Mr. Lung, Chief Executive, the government is not going to prop up the market. Definitely not. I've said them it openly many times. We should not be using policies to maintain the high property prices. And I've said many times that the present property prices are far beyond the affordability of Hong Kong people, particularly young people. Now, long-term housing target is very much demand-led, and we have been uh, doing assessment of demands all the time. Our land is limited in Hong Kong, and for any land developed, we have to uh, fulfill the um, housing needs of Hong Kong people and also needs from commercial and business sectors. So we are doing assessment of needs all the time. If uh, there is an increase in the demand, then we will increase the supply as well. Ms. Lung Chi Cheng. Well, housing production has very much to do with land supply. Now, you are um, adjusting downwards a production target. I believe it has to do with land supply. Recently, I've received a lot of complaints from the, peop from the public, especially those with land um, requisition from them. They said the government's compensation rate is totally out of touch with the needs of uh, the people. And some representatives of districts have said that uh, if you want to develop housing, you have to make sure there's, there are proper roads. Now, like in Pat Hang, and they have asked the government to widen roads on many occasions, but the government wouldn't take heed of their, their demand, and that uh, in turn leads to a problem with land supply. So do you have any solutions to that? Chief Executive, I agree with Mr. Leung. We need to provide the infrastructural facilities, and once the infrastructure is in place, then it will be easier to take forward the other projects. It's not just the concern of the districts. Our transport department is also uh, also cares very much about this. In new development areas, uh, when there's a um, bigger population, um, they will always have to see whether it could lead put uh, pressure to bear on the uh, transport system. But then it takes time to develop the infrastructure. And uh, with land supply, rezoning takes at least one year and then three years to uh, prepare the, to form the land and so on. So it takes four years. And uh, so what we're trying to do is to increase short-term supply as far as we can. And when we consider medium to long-term supply, we will first make sure we put the infrastructure in place first, including roads. Mr. Charles Mark, in this policy address, 
the uh, chief executive said a lot about um, innovation and technology because probably because you don't have any other policies. Well, you might think you're going to win a round of applause. Actually, it just leads to more questions. This morning, in a um, South China Morning Post report, there's uh, this um, Hong Kong person, Michael Gaethy, who's uh, been in business for 15 years. We all know him very well. He said that for this policy address, uh, there's too much focus on startups. So. And if you cannot survive in Hong Kong, how can you survive outside Hong Kong? Now, he's uh, been uh, in Hong Kong for 15 years, but the local companies wouldn't buy local products. And the government hasn't done anything in this respect. Last July, and on the same occasion, I asked you this. Now, your uh, departments are uh, having too much contracting out. And um, so most of the staff are just contract staff, and that's why uh, during the pandering, people care only about the lowest bid. The secretary is here. Uh, okay, he's in post now, but still there's nothing um, from the policy address. There are 80 or 90,000 who work in the IT sector, but many tell us they don't see uh, how they can be helped in this policy address. I don't know if you use LinkedIn. I, I, I suppose you don't, uh, Chief Executive. At LinkedIn, some are saying that money is not everything. We need the infrastructure. We need uh, respect from the people. And another said that uh, this uh, policy address is uh, similar to your 2007 election manifesto. Uh, it doesn't really look like a 2016 policy address. If you support an industry, uh, maybe there are 10 things to do. You can't just do one or two things, and then you say you have supported the industry. Now you uh, on um, including uh, on strengthening procurement uh, technology and so on. Uh, there's new, nothing new, and it's disappointing. This morning, a friend asked me on Twitter. Uh, I think you don't use Twitter either, CE, right? Uh, the two billion dollar IT INT venture fund. How can it trickle down to help the whole industry? We want you to support the. Development of the local IT industry. The government should procure more of local products. You should support more SMEs to use IT. So those are specific questions. Now, in the coming policy address through the financial secretary, are you going to come up with some measures that would really help the industry? Thank you, Chief Executive. Mr. Charles Mock mentioned innovation and technology. Uh, his friends. Um, uh, he's just asking questions of his friends in one go. On innovation and technology, and on government's involvement, it's true we are lagging behind. There's a lot to do. We need to catch up. Now uh, we are three years late in um, having a secretary for innovation and technology. It is only now we have a chapter on innovation and technology measures. I think you all know why. It's three years late. Now, there are several dozens of paragraphs on uh, innovation and technology. It's not just uh, what you mentioned, Mr. Charles Mott. Apart from the uh, Innovation and Technology Venture Fund to uh, nurture startups, we also give support to universities. There's the work of the cyber port. And then the government also funds um, statutory bodies in their work, you know, the science park and so on. So we are adopting a comprehensive approach. But I must admit that this is the first year we are actively promoting this area of work. Uh, it's not just this government. Over the years, I would say this is the first time that we are um, investing in the largest amount of uh, money and, and effort in this single area of work. But of course, we may not be able to see results uh, quickly, but uh, these are the this is the way forward that we must uh, insist on. Mr. Charles Moore, the chief executive kept mentioning three years. I would like to clarify. In 2012, you didn't manage to jump the queue uh, under the uh, reorganization package. Uh, it's because the uh, pro-establishment camp helped didn't help you. So that's why you lost uh, in that vote. Don't blame it on the pan-democrats. And then you. And it was only 18 months after you took office, you uh, presented a proposal on the ITB. So you were stalling things. But uh, he hasn't asked my question, President. That is whether there will be new initiatives in February that we might hear of. 
Mr. Charles Smock mentioned local enterprises and local products. The SAL government is very keen to procure local products and services. The SAL government is keen to support them. That's why in this chapter we have um, announced uh, various measures and initiatives and funds to help them grow and enhance their competitiveness. But then the SAL government must um, fulfill its international obligations in the procurement process. And more importantly, we must consider value for money. We have to do our, the, our value for money assessment in our procurement. Now, today, if um, some of the products are not yet competitive enough, we are more than happy to support the development of um, these, uh, these businesses um, through the various measures announced in the policy address. Mr. Yu Si Wing. Thank you, President. I totally agree with uh, Dr. En Chan and Mr. Vincent Fang. In a policy address, the Chief Executive said that tourism industry is important to Hong Kong, it's a major contributor to our GDP. But last year, there was a drop in the number of visitors. Uh, all tourism related to industries like uh, the, the retail industry, catering, hotel industries, they've all seen substantial loss of business. Some uh, saying that uh, they are going into a severe winter. That's why um, last year, $19 million uh, were earmarked for promotion. But in this policy address, um, when you mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, there are no targeted measures in promoting the development of uh, the tourism sector. Now, there are four pillar industries in Hong Kong, but you just mentioned tourism. Um, by his name, but then you're not uh, putting forward any concrete measures. So in the coming year, are you going to do like what you did last year? Are you going to increase spending on uh, promotion of the tourism industry? And then uh, under the one under the Belt and Road Initiative, there is this uh, Guangdong Hong Kong Macau um, collaboration project. Are you going to um, put, include some concrete measures on? Pro tourism pro development? Well, we, we respect um, the contribution of the tourism sector to Hong Kong. And, um, and it's not just about its share of GDP. More importantly, the, the tourism sector provides jobs for a large number of people in the working population. You know, people working in the hotels, drivers, or sales, working in the retail industry, and so on. So the tourism sector provides a large number of jobs and that's why we attach so much importance to this industry. And as I said yesterday, when we uh, strive for tu tourism development, it's not just about numbers. And um, if there are too many visitors, wherever they come from, it may disrupt the day-to-day uh, -day living of the local residents too. So we need to make uh, fine-tuning. And the tourism sector faces many problems, of course. Uh, that is uh, the appreciation of the Hong Kong dollar following the appreciation of the U.S. dollar. So uh, the Hong Kong currency is expensive and that may affect our competitiveness. And there's a slowing in the mainland economy, so there may may affect the, the interest of uh, mainland residents coming to Hong Kong to visit and shop. And there are also other domestic issues we need to address. How are we going to rebuild Hong Kong as a hospitable city? In the past two or three years, we have to admit that at tourist attractions, at shopping districts, there were certain uncivilized behavior against visitors. And uh, visitors felt unwelcome in Hong Kong. Now, has that uh, affected the interests of uh, mainlanders coming to visit Hong Kong? I'm sure it has. Now, how do we deal with it? The Hong SL government, of course, uh, has to do something about it. But I think it's also for the whole community to reflect upon that. And then the Travel Industry Council recently put forward certain proposals with um, the uh, tourist agencies and practitioners um, f comply. I think, again, it's something for the uh, those in the sector to reflect upon. Now, Hong Kong uh, so it's supposed to be a hospitable host, and that's an important image we want to upkeep. And uh, what about um, forcing people to buy uh, or shop? And it affects our image, and it, it's not, uh, it won't just affect mainland visitors. Maybe overseas visitors would read about reports in Hong Kong 
of such cases. They see how visitors, how mainland visitors are treated in Hong Kong, and that would uh, damage our image. So the sector, the community, the government, and the travel industry council must all work together. Uh, it's not just the effort of any single party. Mr. Yu C. Wing, President, I hope that uh, the ch chief executive can state his stance um, on my question. Last year, $90 million was allocated for uh, doing promotion on tourism, for taking our advertisements. That, nothing was mentioned um, in this report um, on that front. So can the chief executive um, undertake to increase his spending on promotion and also uh, with in relation to the road belt initiative? Can you um, mention something, some uh, work for the tourism industry under that umbrella? Belt Road Initiative um, will cover say, the South Asian countries, and that can be a target for our tourism promotion. And the uh, tourism board's work, um, if needed, we can increase allocation to them, and we can designate the funds to be used for promoting tourism in certain countries. Dr. Leung Kalau. Thank you, President. Mr. Chief Executive, I would like to ask a question about co-location arrangement and XRL project. Six years ago, in 2010, it was decided that uh, the XRL will be built. At that time, um, co-location ar arrangement um, was still a question uh, mark. When we um, made the costs, um, the provisions were for separate co uh, locations rather than co-location. And it was said that there was a, uh, the project was uh, cost effective and there would be a uh, return of uh, some $80 billion and so on. And 60% of the residents were in support of the project, including myself. Now, up to today, um, there have been many changes. And well, the mainland's economic growth is as good as expected, and the patronage was not high, as high as expected, and the costs have risen, um, so we need extra funding. The government seems to be saying that without co-location arrangement, there would not be much benefits to be reaped. So, Chief Executive, if without co-location arrangement, uh, will there still be economic benefits to the XRL project? If the answer is yes, that is economic benefits even without co-location, can you not simplify the issue and the matter? Can you try to separate dealing with the two issues of co-location arrangement and additional funding application? Chief Executive, I am confident that um, co-location arrangement can be put in place uh, in compliance with the basic law. And I'm sure that economic benefits uh, will be better or greater for co-location rather than separate location. Um, overseas visitors and local people would like to travel to popular cities in the mainland, and some of these may not have border facilities. So if we are to implement the XRL project, and if there is separate location arrangement, then border facilities have to be built into certain mainland cities, and then people have to travel to these cities to get border clearance. And then in such a case, there will be bottlenecks created at these uh, designated uh, cities. For the mainland, actually, the mainland or China is one of the um, um, countries in the world with the most developed XRL projects. It has the largest uh, length of railways around the world, and the benefits uh, are many. So I heard that, uh, that the Beijing Shanghai Railway, um, actually, there are plans to build an extra railway because it's now difficult to get a ticket on that section already. So, in face of the changing circumstances, we are reviewing the uh, benefits of the XRL, but 
Anyway, um, co-location arrangement brings more benefits than separate location. Dr. Lang Kalao. President, I think he's trying to sell co-location and also the XRL arrangement. Whether it's um, the public will accept it is another matter. My question just now is that if there is no co-location arrangement, will we still reap benefits from the XRL project? And my second question is, if there are still benefits, would you be dealing separately the issue on co-location arrangement and then extra funding for the project? Well, as Chief Executive, I have answered Ms. Dr. Leung's question. If we are to have separate co-locations, um, at, say, short haul stations, and we have to build in um, border facilities. And if we do that, bottlenecks uh, will be created at these um, cities with border facilities because the travelers have to change there. So I think this um, your question about separate locations is a hypothetic one because we are confident that we can put in place co-location under um, which is in compliance with the basic law. The chief executive's question and answer session ends here. Mr. Lang Kwok Hong, the session has not ended yet. Mr. Lang Kwok Hong, Mr. Lang Kwok Hong, Mr. Lang Kwok Hong. I don't want to have to drive you away at the end of this session. Please keep quiet. The chief executive will now leave the chamber. Members will please stand up. I now adjourn the Council until 11 a.m. on Wednesday, the 20th of January, 2016.